Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress to our conversation today with Ambassador Nicholas Burns. Uh, we're very pleased to have Nick with us today. Um, couldn't be more excited to, to talk to him about foreign policy challenges in 2021 and, and unpack the state of the world and, and where America's going uh, in, in the near term future and looking out over the medium term. Um, we're excited to have Ambassador Burns with us for a number of reasons. He, he's a great friend of the center. He's been a trustee for many years and we're very proud of that relationship. Um, Nick has an amazing background um, as a leader in American foreign policy, as both as a, as a teacher at the Harvard Kennedy School and the head of the Future of Diplomacy Project there, but also as a, a practitioner who has held many of the most important positions in the United States foreign policy, including serving as American ambassador to both Greece and to NATO and uh, rose to the position of Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs at the State Department. So really has had an amazing foreign policy career and uh, brings to this discussion today some particularly useful and, and incredible insights into how American foreign policy is crafted and then carried out. So we're excited to have him. What we're gonna do today is I'm gonna moderate um, a conversation with Nick for about the first half of our hour. And then we will be open, opening it up to audience questions. So I encourage you, if you'd like to ask a question today, to submit a question in writing um, using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, at, at about halfway through, I'm gonna ask Dan Mahaffey to uh, read those questions out for Ambassador Burns. We have a, a lot of folks signed up today. So if you do wanna ask a question, I encourage you to submit it um, as early as it occurs to you. Um, so let, let me just get into it then, and let's start by um, recognizing that we are in the week of the UN General Assembly, which is quite an interesting moment in the uh, foreign policy calendar, the 75th anniversary of the UN. So a lot to reflect on this week, close to a presidential election, um, looking ahead into next year and thinking about where the United States is heading uh, in terms of foreign policy. Nick, let me just start by asking you a really broad first question. What do you think is the greatest foreign policy challenge that's going to confront the United States in 2021? Well, Glenn, thank you. And thanks for starting off with a real softball question like that. I can just give a 30 second answer, we'll dispatch it. Uh, but let me just say first, I'm a proud member of the board of the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress. And um, I joined when David Abshire, the founder, was our was our chair and now Glenn is and Glenn has done an extraordinary job leading us forward building on his foreign policy experience as well as his experience uh, in Congress and uh, we couldn't have a better leader so I wanted to thank you for the invitation and you know, I was thinking Glenn about this session today your organization the one that we support uh, we need it badly now I think the, the greatest challenge facing the United States in national security in foreign policy is our fractured home front, is our divided country, is the hyper-partisanship, is, is, is the fact that we're not coming together as Americans, either at home on the big questions and on many of the global challenges we face. And I don't think any country, even one as strong and vibrant as our country, powerful as our country, can succeed forever if we're not true to our principles and if we haven't connected foreign policy for people back home. And so, I think the most important thing that Joe Biden can do if he's elected or Donald Trump, if he is given a second term by the American people is home front first. Uh, we have to conquer the pandemic uh, in 2021. We have to return our country to normalcy. Uh, th th those were the words of 1920 and 21 when they came out of the, uh, the Spanish influenza, return to normalcy. That was President Harding's slogan as he campaigned. We've got to do that. We've obviously got to lift the economy out of the recession. Most of all, we've got to deal with the most pressing, urgent crisis that we face, and that's the racial, the racial crisis and the lack of racial justice throughout America. And we saw it again yesterday uh, in, in what happened in the court ruling, the grand jury ruling, but also what happened afterwards uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, and throughout the country. And Glenn, I think, I think this all adds up to leadership. Um, I, you and I agreed that I certainly don't want to be uh, partisan, overly partisan today, but I have to be honest. 
I'm supporting Joe Biden for president. I've been an advisor to him and to his campaign uh, for 18 months now. I think he is the right person to unite us. I hope he's elected. I think we need Joe Biden to unite us. If he isn't, then we have to all hope that President Trump um, can change and decide to lead all 50 states, red and blue, and, and to knit us together. And I can't think of anything more important for American foreign policy than writing the ship here at home. And then just very quickly, Glenn, because we want this to be a conversation, not a speech by me. I think on foreign policy, we've got to return to our allies. The biggest power differential that we have, that we enjoy in the world, is that NATO uh, gives us extraordinary strength that Russia will never have in the transatlantic region. And our, our Indo-Pacific allies, Japan and South Korea and Australia and India as a security partner, give us a strength, military and political, that the Chinese will never have in the Indo-Pacific. Rebuild those alliances, recommit to the alliances, find a way to deal with China. We're gonna to have to compete, we'll talk about this. Yeah. But remember that China is not our enemy. And that while we're gonna be largely competitive, and I agree with that, we're gonna to have to find a way to work with China on the next pandemic, if not this one in 2021, and work with China on climate change. And finally, I'd say, Glenn, this is a final thought. Um, I'm a great admirer of uh, General Jim Mattis. I interviewed him a couple of months ago, just before the, everything shut down in DC in February of, of this year. And I'll never forget when I asked him a question at the very end of our interview in front of a Washington dinner crowd, I said, um, what's the, how should we think about American power going forward? And, uh, he has a wonderful way, as you know, he's very articulate of expressing himself. He said, look, uh, Nick, he said, the United States has two great powers in the world. We have the power of intimidation. He said, that's me and my 41 years in the U.S. Marine Corps. We know how to do that. He said, but we have a greater power and it's a stronger power. And that's the power of American inspiration. And he said, I'm not quoting exactly, but you know, it's the Constitution and Bill of Rights. It's our democratic society, it's our immigrant society. And he said, we need to show more of that side of America, this is a military man talking, to the rest of the world. And I think that's, that'd be a good prescription for President Biden and a good one uh, for President Trump if he's returned to office. Well, thanks, Nick. I, I appreciate that uh, opening statement. And as a former foreign service officer, of course, I could not agree with you more strongly about the need to leverage America's allies um, in, in defending and protecting our interests. And I'm glad you mentioned um, your position as an advisor to, uh, to, to Vice President Joe Biden. Obviously, your insights are very valuable here as, we, as we're getting into uh, the end of the election season and looking ahead and at a potential um, you know, Biden presidency for next year. But I also want to note that you've spent your career as a, a professional foreign service officer working for presidents of both parties right and and have played the, and have balanced that um throughout your life and, and i wanted to ask you if, if we could go back to one of those moments and because i want to talk about russia um i want to talk about russia and china in the context of the programmatic work that the center is currently doing regarding uh, great powers competition and how the united states navigates its relationships and its contest with both Russia and China. But let me go back to, to, to a moment in time because you were the US ambassador to NATO. And this question of orienting the United States um, towards the challenges um, that we face um, with Russia is one that you really lived. And, and this is obviously one that has bedeviled the foreign policy community for decades, um, both during and since the Cold War. Um, the question of how to, how to confront uh, Russia and the threats that they pose to U.S. interests is one um, that has been discussed, um, particularly lately. You know, many of our friends have been kind of debating this in public fora um, with op-eds and taking positions about whether we re-engage or, or reset or you know, whatever we want to call it. How do we think through dealing with Russia? But I'm hoping you might share with us, Nick, some thoughts on that question. How do we orient the United States to be successful in countering these modern threats that we're seeing coming out of Russia and positioning ourselves to be successful. And thank you. And um, I think probably the most formative experience of my professional career was the end of the Cold War and its immediate aftermath after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact 
all those communist states in Eastern Europe, and then inevitably, December 25th, 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. I had an extraordinary, as a very young, very junior person, I was on the NSC staff, National Security Council staff, for five years between 1990 and 95. So saw it up close. I saw the brilliance of George H.W. Bush. I worked for him for two and a half years, uh, along with, alongside my friend and mentor, Condoleezza Rice. And um, to see Bush as the American president, really probably at the apogee of American power, 1990, 1991, 92, and then President Clinton's term, when we were truly powerful, when China was really focused on itself, not a global power when the Soviet Union collapsed. President Bush understood that we had to end the Cold War peacefully, that we had to compete with the Soviet Union and yet live with it, that sometimes we would go to the max and win an argument or a fight at the United Nations, and other times we had to pull back and compromise nuclear weapons talks. The INF Treaty of 1987, for instance, between Reagan and Gorbachev. And I think that does give us some insights into what should happen today. Back then, President Bush, when Gorbachev fell and the Soviet Union crashed, he immediately turned to develop a strategic relationship with Boris Yeltsin. And then when President Bush was defeated, and we had this, and I can't resist saying this today, very dignified, very calm, very American transfer of power, where the defeated candidate, George H.W. Bush, gave way to Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton continued, and I stayed on for two years with him as his special assistant for Russia. He continued George H.W. Bush's policies quite deliberately. And so we had this remarkable Republican Democratic consensus at the most important time of how to end the Cold War and how to recommence or rebuild, renew a relationship with an independent Russia, an independent Ukraine, and all the other countries. I think that's a lesson for us. Um, it's understood we're going to compete at home, that the two political parties should compete in a battle of ideas for votes and for power in Washington. But overseas, we can't afford that type of division. And I think as we face Putin today, our problems are, 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 um, are multiple. Number one, he's a threat to the security of all the states that lie to the south and west of the Russian Federation, including some we really care about, NATO members, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. So in essence, we've got to forward deploy our military in Eastern Europe, as we have done under both President Obama, by the way, and President Trump. They probably wouldn't give each other credit, but they've both done the same thing. We have refortified the American military in Germany. We should not be pulling 12,500 troops out of Germany right now because we've deployed some forward into, the, into Poland and our allies, Britain, France, Canada, have put troops, Germany, into the Baltic states. So we've got to contain Putin, contain his power, and prevent any future Crimeas or future invasions of Georgia, number one. Number two, he's obviously Putin assaulting our elections. I listened to a really courageous civil servant. A civil servant is not adequate to his title, the director of the FBI. Chris Ray, and he spoke last week to Congress and he was unequivocal. Russia is interfering in our 2020 election as it did in 2016. And so um, we're gonna rely on our intelligence community, on the Pentagon, uh, on our tech companies, on the FBI to protect the American electoral system in our 50 states and protect our social media uh, from uh, unwarranted intrusion by Russian bots. And, and Russian secret service uh, plans. So that's another front. We've got to compete with Putin. And I certainly believe if he's attacking us in cyberspace, I, I'm out of government, so I don't know. I hope the United States is firing back. Uh, you know, if Putin's going to invade our elections and try to delegitimize the votes of Americans, uh, then we ought to be making it, make it painful for him to do so. There's no equivalent way we can do that, but there are other ways that we can do that. Number three, obviously, um, we're going to have to find a way to work with the Russians on some major priorities. North Korea. The Russians aren't as influential as the Chinese in North, on, on the issue of North Korea nuclear weapons, but they have some say. And we've done best under Democratic presidents, uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, Republican presidents, George W. Bush. We've gotten further on the nuclear issue when we've uh, worked with Russia and China because they've got influence. So that's one. And I think where Russia has true influence is on Iran. Russia's much closer to Iran 
than any European country, or certainly much closer to the United States. We have no relationship with Iran. But I've been convinced for some time that despite all of his, um, all the problems we have with Vladimir Putin, I do not believe he wants Iran to become a nuclear weapons power. And I was the Iran negotiator for the Bush 43 administration for three years. And then my friend, Wendy Sherman, uh, took it forward in the Obama administration. We worked well with Russia. We weren't friends with them. We don't share values, but we were able to work well with them in the sanctioning of Iran and applying pressure on Iran to get to the negotiating table where President Obama, John Kerry, Joe Biden, Wendy Sherman produced a pretty good agreement the, uh, the JCPOA. So I think we've got to think about Russia as competitor. I think the Trump administration has been right to say they are one of the foremost competitors and compete in the areas where I said, but you have to leave room, as we always have done, for these cooperative ventures because that's in the American national interest. Can you talk a little bit, Nick, about NATO and how do we leverage NATO appropriately? You were there um, at a moment in time and do we need to break out of this binary that we're, I think we're stuck in about whether we ought to just beat up on NATO for not paying enough or get out of NATO or go back to the way it used to be? Is there a, is there a third way here where we retool and reorient NATO to, to the, a modern construct that gets us where we want to be? Well, you know, NATO's been around, Glenn, as you know, uh, for, um, for 71 years. It's an American creation and an American invention. Harry Truman, Dean Atchison. George Marshall. It's in the American national interest to say, stay unequivocally. So if you think about what NATO should be in 2025 and 2030, it should be led by the United States. And I, I tell you, John Bolton, and he and I have not been close friends in our career, put it that way. Uh, he spoke for the Aspen Security Forum five weeks ago, six weeks ago. And he said the following on the record, that if President Trump gets a second term, he, John Bolton, believes that President Trump will take the United States out of NATO. I find that to be um, just an extraordinary thing to say. And if Bolton is maybe even 50% right, alarming. What gives me comfort? I don't think there's a senior Republican in the United States Senate or the House who agrees that we should come out of NATO. I find great support in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. And in all the polls, the Pew poll, the Chicago Council polls, among the public, both parties, that we should stay in NATO. So first thing is, America should stay. Second, President Trump's right, President Obama's right, President Bush, they all said to the allies, you have to pay more. Our floor is 2% of gross domestic product. And for a long time, the allies weren't doing much. But you know what happened? When, when Putin invaded and annexed Crimea in March 2014, from 2014 to 2020, the last six years, we've seen real increases in the budget of every single NATO member since 2014. So I know President Trump likes to take credit. I'll give him some credit for that. He really pushed the Europeans. President Obama deserves some credit because he pushed him too. And the increases started two years before President Trump took office. And you know who else deserves credit? Putin, because Putin just scared the living daylights out of people in Europe. The Estonians, the Latvians, the countries that are really exposed, felt exposed, and they began to work. So I actually think this is a good news story. By 2024, the great majority of our 29 NATO allies will be above 2% for the first time in 70 odd years of NATO history. Uh, so NATO is heading in the right direction on defense. We need a common policy on China. That might seem odd for me to say about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but China now is a strategic presence in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. China is a political and economic presence through the Belt Road Initiative in the Balkans and even in Italy, which is now a Belt Road country. China is trying to plant Huawei throughout the network systems of all the NATO allies. And luckily, the British have said no. The Americans have said no. I agree with the Trump administration on that. The Australians have said no. The Indians are going to say no. And there's a big debate in Germany and France now. I think it's tilting. And we need a big NATO consensus on this. Keep the Chinese intelligence services out of our communications networks in, in the NATO alliance, in the NATO space, which is a big space. So focusing on 2030, I think the alliance can actually be stronger. It needs to be more modern. But it is absolutely essential for us, Glenn. And very quickly, I'll just tell you my big takeaway from my three and a half years as ambassador. My 12th day was 9-11 at the very beginning of my time there. 
and when we could not reach my my joint defense state department mission we couldn't reach the state department the pentagon the white house because they'd been evacuated in the hours after the attacks uh, my phone started to ring david wright the canadian ambassador we're with you let's invoke article five get part von Molka, the german ambassador benoit d'aboville uh, the french ambassador we're with you we want to commit to you and by the next morning 24 hours less than 24 hours later every ally had stood up and said if you're going to go to war against al-qaeda we will go with you and i called you'll appreciate this from government glenn i figured i needed some adult supervision here before i committed the united states to invoke article 5 so i called the white house at 4 a.m washington time and i got condi rice my friend and colleague and she had not slept at all during that horrible horrible first 24 hours and i yeah. i said condi i need the president's permission to invoke article five she said go for it uh and i asked her twice if the president could give me that she said i'm giving you the president's permission he's had a really bad day go for it i said i will i'll walk down the hall, hall and vote for it she said one more thing i said what's that she said it's good to have friends in the world hmm. and i've never forgotten that because Whenever I hear any American of either party, of any political persuasion say, why do we need these allies? Reflect on 9-11. Reflect on the fact that all of them went into Afghanistan and they suffered, they suffered a thousand combat deaths. Uh, the great majority of them, three quarters of them, went into Iraq with us. That was a very unpopular war uh, in Europe. They've stood up for us time to time. And you know, given what we're gonna to have to face in the next 10 years, everything from climate change to China, to pandemics, to Putin, president for life, we're so much stronger with allies than we are without them. Well, let me pick up on a couple of those themes, Nick, because that's an incredible anecdote about NATO. And you, you, you broached the question of uh, leveraging NATO now in this competition with China. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on, on China and that challenge. Um, and, and I'd like to ask for your thoughts. You know, the, the center, as you know, is, is very focused right now on this geotechnology competition question. Yeah. Quest for uh, ways to position the United States to compete in communications, in other words, 5G technologies in data governance and data flows and development of artificial intelligence. Some of these key technological areas where we need to uh, maintain American uh, preponderance in order to continue to lead the world. You mentioned the importance of allies and, and, and have highlighted that. And we're also very interested in exploring the U.S. relationship with Japan on this, an important friend and ally who's in the neighborhood with China and shares some of the, many of the same concerns and challenges we do. Can you talk a little bit about how you think the U.S. can best position itself to win that aspect, the trade and the kind of geotechnological challenge that we're facing with China as an adversary. How do we position ourselves for success in that, in that conflict? Well, Glenn, I think I commend you and uh, as the leader of our organization for focusing on great power politics, but also on this technology issue. Um, I'm, a, I'm the executive director of the Aspen Strategy Group. And for the last two years, we've been looking as an organization, Republicans and Democrats together at the challenge from China geopolitically, and then two years ago in eight, 2018, we had three and a half days on your subject, mm. on um, the digital age technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, machine learning, biotech, they're going to be militarized. The Chinese are actively militarizing them now. The Chinese have a plan to kind of leapfrog over the United States to become more powerful by commanding these technologies in the future. Obviously, we've got to respond to that challenge. We don't want to be number two. In our case, it's more difficult. The Chinese government, as you know, can reach into any Chinese university or research lab and say, you're working for the PLA now. Mm -hmm. We have very appropriately, no American government official has that power over Google or over Apple. So it has to be consensual in our case. Mm -hmm. We've got to develop a relationship, a much better relationship between Silicon Valley, our big tech companies, and the Pentagon and our intelligence communities. Walter Isaacson has a very original way of talking about this. And he came to our meeting uh, at the Aspen Strategy Group, wrote a paper for us. He talks about the innovation triangle. And Walter says what made America, I'm just paraphrasing Walter, channeling him, what made America great, he said, from the Manhattan Project through Gemini and Apollo and DARPA and the information age is the fact that we've had, an, we've had a union, a triangle of cooperation, the federal government, 
supplies R&D funding for our great universities and research institutions. Ideas and technologies are spawned and created there. And then in the third leg of the triangle, the private sector monetizes them, develops the product, markets the product, services the product. And that's a virtuous triangle between government, academia, and uh, the private sector. That's how we developed into the greatest scientific and technological country in the world. Walter's concern at the time, and I think it still is, is that um, that R&D funding is drying up from the federal government. I must say this objectively, particularly during the Trump administration. And if we don't have a sense that we've got to unite all the centers of American power, China is going to run past us. Yeah. And, and that's not just me saying this. I remember Bob Work came to our meeting, the former deputy secretary who knows more about this subject than I will ever, ever know. And there's a concern that the United States needs to focus on this. This is not a partisan issue. This is a Republican and Democratic issue. There's probably nothing more important in our national security than not just keeping par with China, but exceeding China. And our advantage, again, will be our allies, Japan, India, Germany, Britain, all very capable in terms of science, technology, R&D themselves. We should be pool, we are beginning to pool resources with them. It's not just the US versus China, it's the big American alliance system responding mm. to this challenge. Well, I wanna, let's pull on that thread a little more because there is, as you suggested, another aspect to this competition, and that's the narrative aspect. It's not enough to just invest in the technology and and have an innovative marketplace that races uh, and gets first to artificial intelligence or, or the best set of data governance and privacy policies that allows us to harness that data. Um, it's, it's also about trust. We have to have yeah. other countries want to share data with us and, and believe in our system. You mentioned um, various countries um, keeping Huawei now out of their networks. It's an important part of this challenge that our friends believe in us. There's a trust aspect, there is a, an inspiration aspect, there's a values aspect. We have to win the narrative that our system is superior and delivers better outcomes and value in order to keep people on side. And it feels like that is something that perhaps there was a period where we could have taken for granted the fact that the American system was just simply the best one and everybody knew it. And now it feels like perhaps it's related in some ways to sort of to COVID response questions, but it's also, it seems like it's getting more difficult to win that narrative battle. We have to put more energy into it. And I'm wondering if you might just share some thoughts on how do we win the narrative battle that the Chinese Communist Party is investing a lot of energy in trying to win on their end of it, trying to say that the authoritarian system delivers better outcomes quicker. And as you mentioned, ours requires trade-offs and we have rules. We have How do we win the narrative battle that shows that ours is the, is the best way? You're right to focus on this, Glenn. Um, we have, we've never encountered a Chinese leader since Mao um, of, of, of the type of Xi Jinping because Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, they were trying to, they were looking inward, trying to rebuild China. They didn't want a problem with the United States. Xi Jinping is directly, he's competing directly. If you read his 19th party, his speech to the 19th party Congress a couple of years ago, he talks about this. I have my students read the speech. He talks about the fact that their system, he believes, is the better system. He's expressing that through the biggest and most ambitious idea in the world today, the Belt Road Initiative. More than 140 countries are part of it. Uh, the estimates of what the Chinese have already spent is $1.2 trillion. I had one of my students told me two years ago, he said, if you take the Marshall Plan, 1947 and 54, and um, in 2018 dollars, uh, the Marshall Plan was about $180 billion. Belt Road is already, already at one point true. So he's, a, he's, he's exhibiting supreme self-confidence about the nature of the authoritarian system. He's saying that that system should be adopted by countries around the world, not just by the Chinese. And so when I hear him say that, I think, where's our Ronald Reagan at the Berlin Wall? Where's John F. Kennedy during his incredible, incredibly uh, inspiring inaugural speech in 1961? We need that kind of leadership in both of our political parties and we don't really have it. And I think Glenn, you and I both know as former diplomats, the United States is powerful because of our military. 
and our intelligence services and because of our incredible economy. At the end of the day, it's Mattis's power of inspiration mm -hmm. that people really respect about us. It's the self-corrective gene. It's Martin Luther King challenging the white establishment in the 1960s to do the right thing and put it into law. And when we don't speak up for those human values in Hong Kong or in Belarus, if you read John Bolton's book, when the president tells, that he, as he did a, uh, 13 months ago, Xi Jinping, I really don't care what you do to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, it's okay to establish these camps that you're building. We lose our moral credibil credibility. And, and one of the many reasons I support Joe Biden is Joe Biden has within him, in his whole philosophy of, of life and leadership, a true commitment to making sure that the United States speaks up when people's rights are being violated. I think that's our biggest problem today, that the rest of the world is uncertain about us, especially our allies, because they don't know where we're gonna be on issue after issue. I'll just say one more thing, which is what I hear from Europeans all the time. The president has spent much of the last three years excoriating publicly Angela Merkel, who's probably the most respected leader in the world today. And he's gone after Justin Trudeau and Emmanuel Macron. At the same time, he's been literally and figuratively embracing Putin and Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. It's not only jarring to our allies, it's upside down. Hmm. They, don't, they, they can't imagine an American global leader who would not want to get out in front to support the people of Hong Kong or the people of Belarus when they're in the streets. I think we're missing that now. We need Republicans and Democrats to begin speaking up. Uh, and we need a president who will lead. I think that's the most important thing about narrative here because we're not gonna be credible unless we walk the walk on these human freedom ideas that are so important to us. Thanks, Nick. We have questions piling up from our interested viewers. So let me go ahead and um, call on Dan Mahaffey to um, get some of those questions in front of you. And thank you so much for your insights so Pleasure. far. Pleasure. Um, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I see we've got a bunch of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll we'll leave it in your capable hands to, uh, to field those over to Nick. Uh, thanks, Glenn, and thank you, Ambassador. We do have some uh, fantastic questions here. I think I'll continue on the, uh, on the China front. Um, obviously, we know what they're willing to do at home with Xinjiang, with Hong Kong, uh, even Tiananmen Square, and that, that was Deng Xiaoping. But when we look at their leaders on the global stage, are they, are they ideologues? Are they mercantilists? Are they realists? How will we deal with them and understand how far they're willing to go on the global stage? What a great question. We could probably form an entire course at any, my university and others on that question. It's a really good one. I'd say this, we know they're not liberal internationalists, the Chinese, the standing committee, the seven people who run China, including Xi Jinping. I think they are realists about the world. They're Chinese nationalists. Uh, they see that China is not rising to power, but returning to power. China having been the dominant global economy in 18 of the last 20 centuries, except for the last two. I think they're very determined to put China as they see it back together, Hong Kong, Macau, certainly, Taiwan eventually, and we should resist that. Uh, and, and their colonization of parts of the Spratly and Paracel Islands in the South China Sea is, is a violation outright of international law, but it's a power play because no one's there to stop them. I think our biggest challenge, Dan, will be to try to figure out two things. This is really hard to do for any of our presidents and secretaries of state. When do we compete and when do we cooperate and what's the balance of the two? For most of the last 40 years, and we normalized our relationship at full ambassadorial level in March 1979, Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping. For most of the last 40 years, 41, we've been largely engaging and sometimes competing. In the last three or four years, we've flipped, both of us. We're now largely competing and we are sometimes engaging. And I'm on the competition side. Uh, in many respects, we need to maintain American military power and predominance in the Indo-Pacific. We need, and the question that, that uh, Glenn and I talked about, I don't wanna be the number two, have us be the number two military power technologically. I want us to be that power. We need to compete in the realm of ideas that Glenn and I were talking about and, and on trade, where China has just completely violated its World Trade Organization commitments on intellectual property. So I think 
no matter who we get in the White House, uh, President Biden, President Trump, you're gonna see in America largely competing and China competing back. But here's the big problem. We're gonna have to leave room for some kind of cooperative joint ventures with the Chinese. We cannot accomplish anything on climate change without China and they without us. We're the two largest carbon emitters. We're probably not gonna be able to get out of the global recession without some type of coordination between the Chinese central bank and the Fed. We certainly will not be able to face a new pandemic at some point in the future with any degree of confidence if we're not both working in the World Health Organization and working bilaterally. So we've got to have a sense that, okay, we're largely competitive and we should compete, but we're going to have to leave room for compromise and cooperation. When Glenn and I talked about how George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy succeeded with the Soviet Union. They had the same dilemma and they were largely competitive, but they left room not to destroy the other, but to try to work with each other when we could. I think that's the frame of mind we have to have with China. Uh, similar to what you've just said about China, where there's that need to compete and cooperate, we talked about Russia earlier and you mentioned working with them on Iran and the, you know, having the Russians at the table, not relegating them to the side that they were perhaps more productive. So are there any areas too that you could think of cooperation with Russia as well as understanding the need to sanction and push back now, but what are off ramps for better behavior from Russia down the road? Thank you. Well, first, I think we should keep the sanctions in place over Crimea over the Donbass and over the interference in the American elections, keep them in place. But I do think there are certain things we could do cooperatively with the Russians on certain forms of counterterrorism. The Russians have a broader and probably more crude definition of who a terrorist is than the United States would. But when we see a common foe, say the Islamic State, if we can work with Russia to defeat that foe, we should do it. Certainly on counter narcotics, both of our countries have been victims of narcotics, car narcotics cartels. When I was uh, under Secretary of State, we did work with Russia in the George W. Bush administration on counter narcotics. That's true in the future. They're not a major player on climate change, but they're the, they're the second largest producer of oil and gas in the world. So like us, because we're the biggest energy power, there are things we should be doing with the Russians to try to transition over time to a clean energy economy. We can do that. And I think, Dan, as you said, both on North Korea and Iran, uh, they're central on Iran and they can be helpful on North Korea. I'll just say, finally, uh, in, in 2005, President Bush decided just after his re-election that as opposed to, we were opposing Britain, France, and Germany talking to the Iranians. We had been. President Bush changed his mind and he said, we're going to help Britain, France, and Germany. And I became that link to those three as a negotiator on the Iran nuclear issue we quickly realized, the United States, Britain, France, and Germany, that we could not succeed in preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power short of war. So by, econo by diplomatic and economic sanctions means without Russia and China. And so we created this, the P5 plus one, the Perm five countries in Germany in December 2005. And for 10 years, President Bush and then President Obama used that as the framework to sanction Iran, drive Iran to the negotiating table, and agree in July 2015 to the nuclear deal. That's another example where Republican and Democratic presidents have worked together, not seamlessly, but essentially with the same idea. On Iran, with the JCPOA, how might the United States be able to re-engage in a possible Biden administration? And what would be some of the longer term concerns you might have about the message sent about US foreign policy if deals like the GCPOA change with administration? Well, um, I wanna say first that I, I, I'm one of many, many advisors uh, to the vice president and his campaign. And the last thing uh, I'm gonna to do today or ever is to try to predict what a president elect or a president Biden would do. It'd be grossly unfair to him, so I won't do that today. I'll just give you my personal view and there are lots of views out there. My personal view is this is gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to decide what to do with Iran because on the one hand, I think it was a major mistake of President Trump to leave the Iran nuclear deal because we had, we had tied them in knots. We had shut down both 
their plutonium processing route to fissile material, and their uh, uranium route uh, to a fissile material. Uh, and we had 24-7 IAEAIs on their nuclear facilities. They weren't going to break out in two decades. And when President Trump left, he didn't offer anything in return. So now we're stuck with the worst of both worlds. We're out. We no longer have influence. We've left the Europeans, Russians, and Chinese high and dry. And the Iranians are now beginning to reconstitute the uranium uh, program in violation of the agreement. So my personal view is you'd have to have the Iranians agree to march back to all the limitations on their program as a starting proposition in terms of how you'd negotiate this. They'd have to agree to go back to 2015 limits. And I'm not sure they want to do that right now. And at the same time, they're the biggest problem in the Middle East in their um, supply of weaponry and militia and intelligence support in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and Gaza. So you, you want to push the Iranians back there. You want to push them back on ballistic missile development. This is going to be a very tough problem for President Trump or President Biden. And I just don't want to speculate what, what Biden would do. But I think you start from the proposition of challenging the Iranians to act like a civilized government. And if they're willing to go back and stand down in their nuclear program, then it might be possible to put a negotiation back together. You'd have to make a tactical decision. Is it just about their nuclear future? Or do you want them also to commit to restrain their ballistic missiles and also restrain their regional activity, which has been so destructive against Israel and against many of the Arab countries? Similarly, as we look at the region, uh, two partnerships, allies, uh, NATO uh, with Turkey, our relationship with Saudi Arabia. How do you deal with sometimes troublesome best friends like that? It's really hard uh, to start with the Turks. You know, there was a time when President Erdogan was a really good partner of the United States. That was a long time ago, 15 years ago. Um, he's now probably the, one of the biggest problems that NATO has. He's purchased the S-400 uh, missile defense system from Russia. And I think NATO has appropriately told Turkey, we can't possibly let you connect that air defense system to the NATO system. It's like letting a cancerous cell loose in the bloodstream. Uh, he has been extraordinarily, I think, uh, cynical and destructive on the issue of the Kurds, both the Kurds in Iraq and, and Turkey, and also the Kurds in Syria. I think President Trump was made a disastrous decision to reduce our special forces presence in Syria. The Syrian Kurds have been a great partner and we left them. And, um, and many, many in their community have now lost their lives. They've been pulverized by the Turkish military. Turkey's been a terrible, terrible influence in Libya, stoking the war there. And something close to home for me, because I was ambassador to Greece for President Clinton, um, Turkey has fundamentally um, contested where Greek borders are in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. We know where Greece's borders are. The United Nations does, and Turkey is actively contesting them. The only good news there is that the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, has been a good intermediary between the two NATO allies. And it looks like, and you might read David Ignatius's very good Washington Post column on this this week, it looks like Greece and Turkey might be agreeing to stand down, lower the temperature, and agree to a diplomatic solution, maybe even referring the territorial dispute to a body like the International Court of Justice. That's reasonable. But I think either a Trump or a Biden administration is going to have to figure out can you work with Turkey on some issues and yet kind of isolate the Turks on others until they return to region? region. The Saudi problem is very different. Uh, personally, I think Saudi Arabia has been unconstrained in Yemen and has brought, bears a lot of the responsibility for the huge number of civilians who've died in Yemen with American weapons in some cases. And so um, I, we, we have to have a close relationship with Saudi Arabia. They're a very important friend but we can't be uncritical. The murder of Jamal Khashoggi was a turning point. There should have been some American sanction there for the outright murder of a green card holder, someone living in Alexandria, Virginia, who wanted to be part of our society. Moving a, a little bit east on the map, uh, Afghanistan and the progress of the negotiations there. And, and what is, how are we to end that conflict and in a way, transition from it, but also understand the, the security interests that we still have there, uh, as well as its strategic location. 
I think it's a very difficult, it's one of those problems, President Obama once said about his inbox, and I'm paraphrasing, the thing about my inbox is I get all the impossible issues because if they weren't impossible, somebody below me in the government would have resolved them in Afghanistan is that issue for President Trump right now. Supremely difficult. Uh, I think we've got the right negotiator. I can't think of a better negotiator for this problem than Zal Halizad, who I really respect. Um, the pro I I'm worried about it, however. We should end the two big wars, uh, bring them to an end. That's, and I think both presidential candidates agree on that, both uh, President Trump and Vice President Biden. How we end it is gonna be very important. I worry that we're putting, that the Trump administration is putting the Afghan government at a disadvantage. I know it took a lot to get the Taliban in the talks in Qatar to the negotiating table, uh, was it a week ago, Saturday. Um, but our fundamental allegiance should be to the Afghan government. They've been, we, they've stuck by us and we've been sticking by them since 9-11, since the Hamid Karzai came in in the wake of the destruction of the Taliban government. And knowing a little bit about the Taliban, I worked on the Afghan issue of, uh, as undersecretary of state and at NATO, I don't trust them. And so you do have to negotiate with your enemies and they're an enemy of the United States. And you do have to bring sorted people sometimes to negotiations. That's the only way to make peace. But you have to be careful of them. And I would, I hope that the President Trump, this is gonna sound political, but it really isn't meant to be. I hope President Trump doesn't rush into this uh, before November 3rd. I think he should give it time. Let the Taliban know that we are behind Ashraf Ghani, uh, Abdullah Abdullah, and the Afghan government and not leave them to the mercies of the Taliban in the future. We should get out, but a deal that we can feel honor, feel it has some honor to it. Uh, in that discussion, you, you mentioned negotiations and we've talked about the Russians as well. One of the things we've worked on too at CSPC, and there's a question we happen to have here as well, is on arms control with Russia, getting back to, you know, even if you disagree, building those guardrails back for the, the most unimaginable weapons. What are the prospects there? And I'm, I, I commend you, Dan, and I commend Glenn for working on this issue. And I'm with you on it as one of your board members. I feel that we're in one of the most unconstrained Wild West atmospheres on arms control. You have to go all the way back to 1963. In the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the first big agreement was the Test Ban Treaty that President Kennedy was able to negotiate before he was assassinated. From 63 onward, we built with the Soviets our enemy. We built an entire constellation of nuclear weapons agreements, strategic and intermediate, designed to drive down the probability of war. And now they're almost all gone. The INF Treaty, President Reagan's treaty, gone. New start. It's going to expire February 1, 2021. I certainly favor extending New Start to give us some strategic stability. Um, and we have to go back to some kind of limit on the type, the type of weapons that the Russians especially can deploy in Kaliningrad, inside the territory of Poland, if you will, or surrounded by it, and uh, in the western part of, of the Russian Federation. So um, we need to recommit to arms control. It's in our interest to do that. This is the dirty, difficult side of diplomacy. You deal with unsavory regimes, but you do it because it's in your country's interest to do it. I will say this. I think that there's a kernel of truth in the, what the Trump administration has been saying about China, more than a kernel of truth to be charitable to them. China is completely unconstrained as a nuclear weapons power. And if the United States and, the, and Russia, and we're both transatlantic or Atlantic and European and Pacific powers, both of us, if we're constraining strategic arms, tactical arms, the Chinese should do. The Chinese want to get out of this. They don't want to be, have any limits imposed and if there's any possibility of working eventually with the Russians to insist that the Chinese uh, limit themselves and limit themselves under international treaty, that should be a goal of the United States as well. India and Pakistan, largely unconstrained. So in essence, you know, I think for a lot of young people I teach at a university, Harvard, a lot of the young people think of arms control as something from the distant Cold War past. It's a very modern 2030, 2040 issue. We, we, we do not want to live in a world where the number of nuclear, the type of nuclear weapons, hypersonic missiles, 
are threatening nuclear stability. We want to drive down the probability of their ever be used. I see some questions here that I'm, I'm going to try and combine them together because we're running out of there's so many good ones, but I, I do want to avoid having a, a traditional DC one where we go around the world but forget sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Yeah. And how do we deal with those regions in a way, you know, leveraging USAID, understanding the, the private sector ties, but also not just dealing with those regions simply because Chinese attention is now showing up there? Well, exactly right. And um, I have to say, I think that um, there are some countries emerging that will be very consequential globally as well as regionally in the next few decades. Nigeria's population is going to, is going to double in the next 40 years. The entire population of sub-Saharan Africa is going to double in the next 40 years. And I would say that Nigeria, South Africa, and Ethiopia, Ethiopia well over 100 million people now, are going to be uh, playing a bigger role outside of Africa, the African subcontinent, as well as inside it. And so the United States should want to have very close strategic relations with those three countries, with Kenya and East Africa, with Senegal, and some of the other states, members of the ECOWAS organization in West Africa. We have strategic long-term interests in Africa that we should be building from a strategic point of view. You're right, Dan, that what we sometimes do best is um, the Power Africa initiative of President Obama, the PEPFAR program. Uh, which I think is probably the single greatest success we've had of President George W. Bush working with the Democrats in Congress to appropriate $30 billion over 10 years. So there's that side of our approach to Africa. And, and certainly we can do more to stimulate American corporate interest, not just because we want to compete with the Chinese, but we should compete with the Chinese. We should. But the way we can do this is maybe the United States and European Union we're actually the two largest economies in the world in nominal GDP. Maybe we should be combining efforts to offer our version of a Belt Road Initiative that doesn't lead to long-term indebtedness. There's a lot of smart people who can help us do this inside our country and out. So, and America has lots of friends in Africa and we pay too little attention to it. So thank you for the question. We also have a question here and it reminds me of, we all discussed our various experiences working with Dave Abshire, uh, Ambassador Abshire, who always was fond to say that the NATO treaty he was told was written so that an Omaha milkman could understand it. And it wasn't just about the pithiness of the treaty, but it was about uh, the question we have here. And it reminds me, how do we explain how diplomacy, diplomatic efforts, treaties, how does that connect to the domestic interests of the American people? Boy, is that a key question. Because as I think as a lot of us travel around the country, at least before COVID-19, we traveled around the country. Now we Zoom around the country. Um, we've got to connect American foreign and defense policy to the concerns of the American citizenry. That's what democracy is all about. And I'm not sure that, I know that in many administrations which I participated, we didn't do that effectively. We certainly became overly engaged and overly committed in the Iraq and Afghan wars and then we heard about it from the American people in both political parties, Bernie Sanders on the left, people like Rand Paul on the right, and they weren't wrong to say, is there some limit? I think they were reflecting the opinion of a lot of Americans. These unending conflicts, we can't just stay forever. So we've got to spend a lot of time talking to Americans about why we need to be engaged. And I think here's the fundamental fault line in this election. The president's theory of the case is, President Trump, and he believes this sincerely, the United States is better off acting alone in the world. I don't think he's always an isolationist, he's a unilateralist. Joe Biden's theory of the case is, the, and, 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 he's, and I think he's got much more support in both parties on this. The United States is much stronger if we share the burden. Why should our soldiers do all the fighting? Well, if you don't want our soldiers to do all the fighting, then NATO, you get everybody in as we got thousands of NATO soldiers, uh, European soldiers in with us to the Afghan conflict. If we want to protect jobs in the United States, we need trade agreements that protect jobs. If we want environmental and labor standards and trade agreements, then you need to build that in. If we want companies to succeed, and we should want the American corporate sector to succeed, we need a level playing field on trade. I think if you just break down what diplomats and generals and admirals and CIA officers do into those components, do we have friends in the world who will 
who will be with us through thick and thin. Yes, if you pay respect to them in places like NATO and don't leave. Do we have trade agreements that work for average Americans, not just for wealthy Americans? We can do that, but we'll have to change the way we think about trade, and we should. And do we have the government thinking every day, how do we help American companies and American jobs be secured? And, and that's through our economic and commercial efforts. So how do we protect Americans from future Al-Qaeda's, from chemical weapons, from biological weapons? By having the CIA and NSA and Pentagon and State Department, we're worth it. And I think breaking down American interests into very practical issues like that, Americans understand it. American, I mean, people are smart, really smart about the world. Most people have traveled someplace, but they don't want Washington just to be thinking about overseas. They want it to connect it to their lives. And um, I don't think the current president has done that because he, off he hasn't offered a hopeful vision. And for me, our greatest presidents, you think of Ronald Reagan in my lifetime, or John F. Kennedy, Eisenhower, have been able to, with some degree of confidence, say to the American people, we can handle our, our adversaries. We can resolve our problems, but we can do something even greater. We can, we can show the best face of America as, as a democracy, and we're not doing that now. Uh, and we need to get there. Again, it's Mattis's power of inspiration, not just hitting people over the head, but showing them the real side of American society. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I think that covers uh, all the questions we have today, although I'm sure we could go on, as you said, a, a full Harvard course to, to answer all of these. Dan, thank you. And thanks to Glenn Nye. And thanks to the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress. It's, you're doing great work. And I'm proud, I'm proud to be one of your board members. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for sharing your, your amazing insights uh, from your deep experience dealing with a lot of these foreign policy questions. We appreciate you being with us today. Um, we've had a great turnout today, one of our most popular sessions, unsurprisingly. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, other board members, Tom Pickering, Ambassador Tom Pickering and Jay Collins, who are with us today, as well as um, our friend Ambassador uh, Todd Sedgwick and Counselor Tenley Albright. Um, That's quite a group. We had a great group. We also had a number of CSPC fellows and students from schools across the country joining us, uh, practitioners from Washington, and um, just a really great diverse group of people sending terrific questions. Nick, again, thank you for your time. It's an honor to work with you. Looking forward to doing more in the future, and thank you for sharing this hour with us today. My honor, Glenn. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody.